Well, greetings, Imagination Cutsurers. Once again, it is I, the sanctimoniously notorious RMB, here on a Saturday pre schmodown Yes, I'm going to be participating in the Schmodown uh, this today. I guess it's live. You know, I just show up. I just do what they tell me. First of all, before I start, I want to welcome all of you Imagination Connoisseurs to this, the Post Geek Singularity community, and it's great to have you here. But I want to start out by mentioning something that is a byproduct of being on YouTube. It's kind of a fun byproduct, something I, I didn't think I would ever be tickled by, but I am. I'm always tickled by it when some other YouTuber that I admire or like mentions me on their show. And so uh, to that end, I want to give a big shout out to Dave Cullen of the Dave Cullen Show, uh, somebody who I would also group in with us members of the intellectual dork web. But Dave has been putting out some great content for quite some time. He does a lot of Star Trek related content and I, I thoroughly enjoy his channel and I like everything that he makes. And um, it was great. He he mentioned me, he used a little clip from this show on his chat he put up today about the roadmap that Alec Kurtzman, Alex Kurtzman lined out to, to go ahead or lined up to move forward with the Star Trek franchise. Uh, check out Dave Cullen's video over at the Dave Cullen Show on YouTube. Uh, I don't think that's the name of his channel. It's like Computer Future or something. I don't remember the actual name of his channel, but I want to thank you, Dave, for mentioning me uh, because that was a very cool thing to have. To, to, to have. I mean, I appreciate that. I think he's he's mentioned me before, but but this time I actually saw it as as a result of watching his new video popped up in my feed and I had to watch it. And you know, it really got me thinking about Star Trek. Go figure. I was thinking about Star Trek as I usually do on most days and I realized as he was talking about Kurtzman's Star Trek and also Star Trek 09, basically the last 10 years of the Star Trek that we've been getting and I was thinking about the Picard series and I was thinking about what is there there's there's one one simple idea that you can distill Star Trek down to, not the actual essence of Star Trek, but what makes successful Star Trek? What is the best Star Trek? And I was just talking to Mike Bodden about this. And I came up with this notion, and I think it's, it's quite accurate. Star Trek, first and foremost, despite everything else it's about, all the stuff that's going on in Star Trek, it has to, first and foremost, understand that Star Trek needs to present an audience with a group of people that they would love to hang out with and spend time with. Most of all, people that they admire. That's it. Despite the science fiction genre trappings, you have to ask yourself, is this crew of people, group of people that we want to hang out with? And what I find really interesting is that when I was growing up as a kid, I wanted to be Kirk, Spock, or McCoy. I didn't care. I wanted to be on the Enterprise. I wanted to be in close proximity with those people because they were the best of the best. And despite their differences, they had already overcome all of those. Because when you're out on the edge of the final frontier, seeking out new life and new civilizations, you have to be the best of the best. The best that humanity has to offer. And who wouldn't want to be around those people? Because they're not douchebags. I mean, sure, they can be stern, they're, they're opinionated, but they're really good at their jobs. And first and foremost, they also recognize when other people are good at their jobs and how much they need those kind of people around them. And so that's what, to me, your baseline of Star Trek should always be. Does the audience want to hang out with those people? Does the audience admire those people? I mean, and I think you can have the, Ros the Rosanante, the, 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 the ship from The Expanse. I don't necessarily like all of those people all the time, but I'd certainly like to hang out with them. And if I was in a crisis, I'd want to be with them. If you look at the ensemble casts of many of our favorite genre shows, whether it's Buffy, whether it's Mulder and Scully and The X-Files, I mean, they're all people that for you do pretty much want to hang out with. In Star Trek 09, Captain Kirk, my favorite character, was a douchebag. I didn't want to hang out with that guy, nor did I think he belonged in the captain's seat of a heavy cruiser. He hadn't earned it yet. The whole Kobayashi Maru scenario, it's not to rip on the, 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 the Star Trek 09. There's a lot of people that like it. I particularly don't, but I understand it's, it's not a bad movie, and everybody's doing a great job, but I just don't like those characters as people. 
Spock is is simmering in anger. He's about to hulk out every moment of that show. Kirk is is they there's a fundamental misunderstanding of the character of Kirk on display. That's not the fault of Chris Pine. It's the fault, it's the fault of the writing. But ultimately, a Star Trek show should really be about people that we all admire and want to hang out with and and appreciate what they're doing. And I think that fundamentally what's happened to Star Trek is this idea that we're going to create drama by making these deeply flawed people. You know that's what they're going to do with the Picard show. They're going to turn him in, as Dave Cullen was talking about today. They're going to turn him into a, a character that's disillusioned and 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 left Starfleet under bad terms or whatever, and it's going to be Logan'd out. And I understand Patrick Stewart was in Logan. Logan was a great movie. But that's not what Star Trek is. Now, that's my opinion, sure, but I'm right. I'm right about it. You know I'm right. Let's hear what you have to say. Anyway, yesterday was a lot of fun. Uh, I liked being all positive and shiny and glowy, and that, that was what the show was about yesterday. So first of all, I'm going to do that today, too. And remember, the show's been brought to you by Lucky Tiger Men's Grooming Products for those men who want to look good and feel great. I did just use their um, face scrub on my face. And if you go to their website, which is getluckytiger.com, you buy some stuff there and you use PGS for Post Geek Singularity, you get 20% off your order. And who doesn't want that after all? Well, I'm going to start today with, would you would you believe that I have a letter from Willow Yang that doesn't involve Star Trek? Well, it kind of does peripherally, but it, 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 is, it is the topic of today's conversation. It was a great letter. Once again, Willow Yang knocks it out of the park. There's a reason why Willow Yang has a spot on the burnettwork.net website called Willow Talk. And you know what? This is exactly the kind of sweet nothings you'd want her to whisper in to your ear if you were ever in that position or whichever position you'd be in with her. So anyway, this is, once again, Willow Yang, uh, in my mind, sending me a letter that perfectly exemplifies what this channel is all about and what you, as members of this, the Post Geek Singularity community, want to hear. It's certainly a message I want to convey, but I didn't have to convey it because Willow Yang conveyed it so eloquently and she sent it to me to pass along to you, and I'm proud to do so. So thank you, Willow. I, I, this is, I'm, I'm pre-thanking you, but let me read the letter. Greetings, Rob. As you know, I've recently attended a science conference in Boston. I'd just like to share a story about what happened there that reminded me of how wonderful cinema is. Science conferences are usually attended by a very diverse assortment of people. Even though the majority of the researchers at the aforementioned Boston conference work in labs located in North America, their countries of origin are all across the globe. In our lab, for instance, we have people from Japan, New Zealand, France, Turkey, Korea, Mexico, and Israel. Whenever we travel together out of the country, we bewilder the border officers who are inevitably curious about how a group of people from such disparate parts of the world would know each other. On this particular occasion, there were four of us, my Japanese PI, a French postdoc, a Turkish undergraduate, and myself. While going through the airport security on our flight from Vancouver to Seattle, the postdoc and I went up to border services together. The officer behind the counter took a look at us, a tall, voluptuous French woman and a short, chubby Chinese girl, and actually asked if we were related. I guess you never know. To be honest, however, I'm actually not particularly keen on attending conferences. While I do enjoy listening to other people's researches, I'm almost cripplingly shy and socially inept. Uh, it can be rather stressful and taxing for me to try interacting with strangers. Oftentimes, I just hide myself away in the corner of a room whilst everyone else socialized. On this occasion, I made an effort to get more out of my comfort zone and engage with as many people as I could. The conversations weren't always successful, and I embarrassed myself on several occasions, the most egregious of which was when I accidentally blew off a PI who was a close friend of my supervisor's. I won't go into details of what happened, but it was a mistake that'll probably haunt me for the next few weeks. Something happened on the third day. After our morning talks, one of which was given by a PI whose lab was evolving E. coli to become resistant to ionizing radiation, my Turkish colleague and I sat together with a young lady from Denmark and another from India for lunch. Since I'm not a good conversationalist, I allowed my much more outgoing colleague to do most of the talking. That was until the Danish scientist said, do you know what show I thought of in reference to the aforementioned talk about E. coli radiation experiments? Unable to resist the opportunity to talk movies or TV, 
I asked if it was Chernobyl, seeing that that show's currently very much in our cultural zeitgeist. It turned out, however, the Danish scientist was actually thinking of the 100. I haven't watched the show myself, but apparently the Earth was irradiated in the series and a population of humans were able to evolve radiation resistance in a century. That is only three to four human generations. By comparison, the E. coli cultures took several thousand generations to acquire significant radiation resistance, and bacteria have much higher mutation rates than humans. So obviously, there isn't much verisimilitude. <laughs> But that got us talking about TV shows, and before we knew it, we were discussing the final season of Game of Thrones. Opinions were divided amongst our group. The Danish scientists and I were more favorable. The Indian and Turkish scientists, not so much. But we all agreed that the story felt quite rushed. The discussion over the writing on Game of Thrones led us to talking about the new Star Wars trilogy. I, controversially, enjoyed The Last Jedi. The rest of the group, however, were unanimously disappointed with the movie, primarily with what they perceived to be a complete change in the pacing and storyline that had been set up in The Force Awakens. They shouldn't have had three different people making each of the movies, opined the Indian scientist. At least they brought back J.J. Abrams for the last movie, agreed the Danish scientist. In spite of their criticism to The Last Jedi, however, they still concurred that the new movies were an improvement over the prequels. My Turkish colleague particularly took issue with the rather cringy relationship between Anakin and Padme, which she thought was very creepy. I probably liked the prequels the most out of the group, but I couldn't resist bringing up the hilariously absurd line, It's over, Anakin! I have the high ground! Upon hearing that, the Danish scientists introduced me to the Bananakin meme, which replayed the aforementioned duel on Mustafar with Anakin and Obi-Wan as bananas. We had a good laugh over it. We reconvened again the next day, which was also the final day at the conference. This time, we were joined by another young lady from Chicago. We discussed our itineraries for the following morning, and I bemoaned the fact that our lab had booked flights for 6.30 a.m., meaning that we'd have to wake up at the ungodly hour of 3 a.m. in order to make it through airport security on time. Wake up at 3 a.m.? Willow, you party until 3 a.m., and then you leave. Anyway, just uh, just as, as an aside, since I'm unable to sleep on planes, it was going to be a long and exhausting day. The Danish scientist revealed that she couldn't sleep on planes either, and that she'd spent the eight-hour flight from Copenhagen to Boston watching movies, including Captain Marvel. This led us into a discussion on Marvel movies. I consider Endgame to be on par with Infinity War, so I was taken aback to hear that everyone else in the group were rather lukewarm towards the former and unanimously preferred the latter. My Turkish colleague was particularly passionate on the subject. She considered Gamora's death in Infinity War to be the greatest moment in all of the Marvel movies and was critical of Endgame for reusing the music score from the scene for Black Widow's death. The group also expressed disappointment over the lack of Captain Marvel in the movie. Many of them were Brie Larson fans. My Turkish colleague raved about her performance in Room, enthusiastically recommending the movie to the Indian scientist who had yet to see it. Unfortunately, she made the mistake of saying the room instead of room. I had to correct her, of course. And the next thing we knew, the conversation had devolved into everyone doing Tommy Wiseau impressions. I did not hit her. It's not true. It's bullshit. I did not hit her. I did not. Oh, hi, Mark. You're tearing me apart. You're tearing me apart, Lisa. You're just a chicken. Cheep, 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 cheep. It wasn't exactly the most scientific and mentally stimulating discussion we've had, but it was definitely the most relaxed and joyful I've felt around strangers. I've been reflecting on what had happened at that conference. There are definitely some topics of discussion that are ne nearly universal. Food is one of them, which is unsurprising seeing that every human needs to eat to live. It does seem a little strange, however, that we'd all be drawn to something as superfluous as art and entertainment which don't have an obvious contribution to our survival as, say, eating. I do wonder how long it has been this way. Have we been convening over stories ever since our ancestors have evolved sentience? And I couldn't be more thrilled and grateful that we have acquired this trait, that a diverse group of strangers from all over the globe could come together and debate, discuss, and laugh over films, whether it's on YouTube or at a science conference. We're very different people with very different experiences tastes, and opinions, but we're all human beings who love cinema, and I think that's just grand. Yours sincerely, Willow. Once again, Willow, crack. 
over the third base fence. Uh, you know, what a great letter. And I, I think that you, you, you once again sort of distilled in your very eloquent manner uh, something I've thought about my whole life. I mean, I think on one hand, though, I, I, I think I got to correct you. I think that storytelling has been around with us since the dawn of time, since humans could 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 ever convey stories, whether they were drawing using fingers in their sand or in the sand or sticks, or they're drawing pictures trying to convey what had happened on the hunt that day. I think we've all told stories to each other because we're trying to convey our experiences to other people. And in conveying our experiences to other people, we hope that they understand us. I think storytelling, the great power of storytelling is that it contextualizes the human experience in a, in a narrative that allows everyone to sort of take some truth from that narrative. And what's very interesting to me is I think, why has it, I got a letter, actually I'm going to read it later, um, from somebody from India and, and the Indian film industry uh, cranks out as many movies as we do, if not more. And yet we know very few Bollywood movies in the United States. And yet American movies seem to translate the world over. There's something, there's something uniquely American in our, whatever it is, in the way we tell stories and the importance of our stories that seems to translate across, across the globe. And I think, that's, I think that's tremendous. And as I've said many times before, isn't it amazing that cinema which is the culmination of all of the art forms that we've had, whether it's writing, whether it's drama, whether it's dance, movement, it comes down to craftsmanship, painting, building sets. I mean, literally every single artistic endeavor is brought together in, in the cinema with the added benefit of technology. Without technology, there would be no cinema. Without electricity, there's no cinema. And without everything that we have, there is no cinema. But the best part about a movie, and I think the most powerful part, and I hope it never goes away, is that when you have a, a, a theater of, say, 500 or 1,000 seats, you have people from all walks of life, people that are couldn't be more different from one another, all gathering in the same place, Whether you whatever your religious beliefs are, whatever your sexuality is, whatever you, how you, however you identify your gender, whatever it is, the most disparate human beings will come together in a theater, sit down quietly, allow the lights to go down and focus all of their attention on the screen in front of them. And if you think about that, especially in our times today, the idea that we could get anybody, I don't know if there's a person on earth that could get a bunch of disparate people that believe very, very different things together in a room and listen to what they had to say for two hours. Some people can, but usually the people that sit down and listen to those people are already like-minded. But cinema cinema and all around the world there's stories being told from every place every land um and and we're getting more voices this is why i'm always telling people at the end of my chats every single person you meet has a story to tell you have yet to hear all you have to do is listen and i firmly believe that it's bared out to me every single day of my life uh no matter where i even i i make chit chat with people I know it's probably hard for you to believe, but I try and talk to people wherever I go. And believe it or not, I ask them questions. The interviewer in me kicks in and I ask them questions because I already know my story. I, I, I talk to you guys all day long, so I don't need to tell anybody about myself. I'm more interested in learning about others because that's the most important thing, I think. And, and cinema and storytelling is the best way to do that. My friend David Starzik, who is an actor... He, he's been, if you look him up on the IMDb, he's never broken through and been a lead in a TV show or a movie. He's done some low budget stuff, sure. But he's pretty much been a guest star on every single TV show you've ever watched. His next role, he's in the new Veronica Mars series. He plays Dick Casablanca's father, which he did in the original show. They brought his character back. David Starzik is in Europe with his lovely wife. They're in Italy. And he's been posting pictures and sending me pictures of his journey. And what's interesting to me is he's been blown away how many times he's been stopped on the street because he's been in so many different shows that he's he, he's never been recognized so much anywhere in his European, European trip. And it's funny because uh, I've known him now for, I met him at Full Moon Entertainment, oh God, 25 years ago when he did a movie called Spirit of the Night 
aka Huntress. And I put him in Free Enterprise. He has a very memorable line in Free Enterprise. If you've seen Free Enterprise, he's the guy that says, Oh, Robert, the Trekkie, right? That's David. But but he was talking about how, and David, of course, is old school. He loves Marcello Mastriani, is one of his favorite actresses, actors. You know, he loves Feline. He bought an eight and a half t shirt. Uh, he went to what is it, Cinecita, the 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 uh, the famous Italian movie studio. He bought a he bought an eight and a half t shirt over there, and and he he he's just one of the greatest. Him and his wife are the most beautiful couple in the world, and and his wife is one of the most beautiful women I've ever met. His wife actually plays the Vulcan Talera in uh, the Vulcan scene that I directed for the Never to Be Made Axanar feature film. So that's you can see her, and then you can look up David Starzik. But but it, it, he reminded me of the fact that. He does a TV show and all these TV show guest stars, guest starring roles, and these TV shows play all around the world. And he gets recognized. And and these stories, I mean, they matter. Everyone says, Oh, you know, you're just you're just making you're just making television or movies. And and the thing about uh TV and movies is they do matter. And and I think that what Willow says is as she says in her letter, it does seem a little strange, however, that we'd all be drawn to something as superfluous as art and entertainment, which doesn't have as obvious a contribution to our survival as eating. Well, I would say, uh, no, I would say that the contribution it has to our survival is not sustenance, uh, physical sustenance, but it's mental sustenance. We as human beings, because of the way that we have evolved, we need that kind of a connection with one another. And, you know, you could be the loneliest person in the world, but you can get a connection to the rest of the human race through storytelling. Um, and I, and I think our stories are, are important and they matter. And yes, isn't it crazy that motion pictures and television are this weird collision between art and commerce, you know, while sure, I would love to, I would love to make lots of money. One thing that's eluded me in my career is great commercial success. Although I'm still hoping for that. But I'll tell you something. For me, sitting in a room with a director over the last on and off for the last three and a half years, we've literally put in thousands of hours on this low budget indie movie, Tango Shalom. Uh, I wouldn't trade it for the world. It's 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 crafting that story. And a lot of people look at me and go, Ugh, who's even going to see that movie? And I'm like, you know what? In 25 years, someone's going to see this sweet little movie, Tango Shalom, and they're going to they're going to they're going to enjoy it. It'll put a smile on their face. It's kind of like when David Fincher talked about when he was making Seven, they always wanted him to change the ending where Gwyneth Paltrow's head is not in a box. And, and he said, no, 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 because in 25 years, someone's going to watch this movie on late night cable or whatever, and they're going to they're gonna remember it and be like, have you ever seen this movie where it ends with the, one of the protagonist's wife's head in a box? Have you ever seen that movie? And, and I think that, that, look, we watch these movies over and over again. And of course, movies and television, well, movies have only been around for more, little more than a century. So we'll see as we have holographic 3D images and as technology by 100 years from now or 2D movies are going to probably be this quaint little, we'll look at them as we go into museums and look at frescoes from long ago. But because once you can plug into the noggin and we finally have holodecks and can live in Dixon Hill fantasies or be in Snow Crash or whatever, you can be a hero protagonist in your own story. It's going to be a different thing. But I think that collectively as people, we definitely are brought together. And, and after all, let's face it, what are movies and TV shows and stories, if not fun, ultimately? They bring us joy. They make life worth living. They contextualize the human experience. We can see out there, a great story has truths in it. Look, I might never have been a secret agent, or I might never have been a wizard, or I might never have been a Jedi or a superhero. But even within the context of those stories, there are human truths that we can extract from them. The idea of what happened in Civil War, for instance, between Tony and Steve, totally understandable. The Sokovia Accords making superheroes register, Steve thought that was not patriotic and it wasn't what all America was all about. Tony Stark, of course, on the other end of that, other side of that argument, we can see both of his, both of their reasoning. Even in the comic books, when Civil War was running, Marvel was billing the series as whose side are you on? And what I loved about the original Civil War comic and the movie is that your allegiances as a viewer were shifting. You could see Tony's point of view and you could Steve see you could see Steve's point of view. And it put you in my favorite adage of storytelling, the what if would I way of story uh, of stories that we as we as audience members consume. 
What if I were the protagonist? Would I act that way? And, and I think that's important, you know, and, and, and we learn from stories. There's truths in every great story. And those, those human truths are, are we glean the truth and we understand things about ourselves through our favorite stories. Even though you're watching a story that takes place in a long time ago in a galaxy far, far away or during World War II and Rick's Cafe American, there's, there's truth, truth in all of those stories, I tell you. And uh, they matter. They matter. They contextualize our own lives. And I, I think that uh, Willow did a phenomenal job distilling down how I've certainly found that I've used pop culture to break the ice, whether I was in Bulgaria talking to a guy who spoke no English, clearly Mutra Mafia, who ran basically the piano bar, which was really, a, let's face it, a brothel that was in this hotel. But he and I would communicate via lines. I could do lines from American gangster movies that he was downloading in the corner illegally. <laughs> <laughs> so American pop culture can traverse boundaries. It can traverse culture. And I think that's an actually all pop. It depends where you're coming from. If I go to the UK, I'll talk to Terry about the Thunderbirds or Joe 90 or something, you know, the persuaders. <laughs> uh, it, it, there's pop culture everywhere. And uh, I think storytelling is the one thing that people can agree on. Everyone's got a favorite movie or a story to tell. Everyone's got a favorite book. Who knows what it is, but. I think it's a great way to break the ice. Mark C is here. Mark C says, those who dislike the prequels, pre please try The Clone Wars by Filoni and company. It doesn't fix everything, but gives character development that makes Revenge of the Sith feel earned. I cannot agree with Mark C more on this point. I love The Clone Wars. It started out a little sketchy for me, but as it goes along, man, is it worth watching. If you haven't watched, now that's, uh, Gennady, Gen Gennady, Gennady, I can't pronounce his name. The Fergenity, who did the first Clone Wars animated series. That was cool, too. But when the CGI Clone Wars animated series got, got rolling, it was really good. And I loved all the way up to the sixth season. And they're doing a new season. I can't recommend that show highly enough. Uh, it's great. It's great stuff. And I think, um, yes, absolutely. Worth seeing especially if you're a Star Wars fan. Stubble McShave says, enjoying Willow's letter with a vodka tonic. By the way, I've got an epic letter from Stubble coming. Uh, Wade O'Neill says, check out the Star One album Space Metal. There are tracks based on Star Trek Four, Dune, Blake Seven, Aliens, etc. Great album from 2002. Well, Wade, I will check that out. Star One, their album Space Metal. I don't know that, but... Um, I, I want to check that out now. Factual opinion is here, and everyone knows I like factual opinion because it's Avatar or Avatar. Uh, asks, should Paramount reboot the Star Trek film franchise? Look, I, I think they absolutely should reboot the film franchise. But, you know, listening to, uh, if you go and, and look at Dave Cullen's video, when you listen to Alex Kurtzman talk about Star Trek, about how, you know, they need to make Star Trek for kids, I'm like, dude, Star Trek was for everybody. I discovered it when I was five. You know, I don't know if I would have become a Star Trek fan. My friend Darren Dockerman says he first explored Star Trek through the animated series. He saw the animated series first, and I don't doubt him. But, I mean, I loved Star Trek as a five-year-old because of the original series. Uh, there's something in it I could recommend, um, uh, I mean, to other kids. I loved Star Trek. I don't think... We have this weird idea that we have to make entertainment specifically for children. Which, the, in, why, do, why do we have to infantilize kids? Always punch up, never punch down. Kids are smart. You know, they want to watch cool stuff. They don't just want to watch, like, ridiculous kid shows where all the kids on the shows act like adults. They're all smarter than the adults. No, no, no. I watched Star Trek because I wanted to grow up and be those people. Even Luke Skywalker, when I saw Star Wars when I was 10, I'm like, I'd want to grow up and be Luke. I actually want to grow up and be Han or maybe even Ben Kenobi, because then I would have been a grizzled war veteran, but that would have been cool. But, I mean, it's it's like making... It, it's so wrong-headed, and it's a fundamental lack of understanding. Even the Clone Wars series is not made for kids. It appeals to kids, sure, but it's made for everybody, and that's the best kind of entertainment, entertainment that's made for everyone. Walt Disney certainly knew that. Uh, Stubble McShave says, your Schmodown performance was interesting. For those who don't know... I do this movie trivia Schmodown thing where I play a character called the Captain. I used to do it years ago when 
it wasn't as serious and people didn't study as hard. And now I've become sort of this, I'm a heel. I've turned heel and I play a very loud over the top character. If you want to see, you can go to yesterday's match. You don't have to even watch my match that I was doing with Tom Dagnino. There's a, or, 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 <laughs> there's a long story behind it, but anyway, thank you for that stubble. It was certainly interesting. Farky 50 says, Keanu, you're all breathtaking. I believe we are too. What, uh, what, what he is referring to is Keanu introducing cyberpunk. What is it? 2077 at E3, which was quite a fun, a fun, uh, a, a fun thing to watch. <laughs> If you haven't seen that. Um, okay. Uh, Aaron Johnson is here. He asks something interesting. He says, hey, Rob, I enjoy both your show and John Campia's as always. Earlier on John's show, he mentioned a topic regarding what it takes to make an episode. It's fascinating because as a fan of movies and TV shows, I usually am fascinated by how a YouTube channel is operated. What fascinated me was how well the schedule is. Typically, most YouTubers plan the videos depending on when they do them. I just want to get your opinion on this. Well, it's a good, I mean, to be honest, for these shows, I just pretty much sit down now. I, I kind of try and think of a topic in advance. If I don't have one in advance, usually, like today, I thought Willow Yang's, um, I, I, her letter is almost like my manifesto. It's exactly what I hope to achieve through this channel, which is convey my own excitement and love of storytelling in all of its myriad forms and share it with all of you, you imagination connoisseurs who yourselves love stories. So when I read Willow's letter, I'm like, okay, well, this is the topic of today's conversation. And I went online and I, I, I was like, I literally punched into Google storytelling and this picture popped up of people sitting around a campfire. And I'm like, ah, there you go. That's exactly what I wanted to convey, even though she talked about Star Wars or whatever uh, in her letter and Game of Thrones. I didn't want to do that. I, I thought more of a general topic uh, would be something to do. But then, so I actually go into my editorial software. I create my little graphic with my, as somebody pointed out, my author picture. I mean, it, it's very funny because to me, there the, if you add an element of pretension to this, you, you kind of have to do it with a wink and a nudge. It's supposed to be funny. Like, I don't sit there and think I'm some sage-like uh, man sitting. I'm not no Oracle of Delphi. I'm not sitting on some mountain bequeathing you with knowledge. I'm just here to share my enthusiasm with everybody else, with all of you. But somebody accused me because I used that author photo, and it's like me pensive, um, that I – it's just a, a picture that's uh, actually – easily accessible and I have used it as an author photo, but I like the picture. It's just, so I've built in these elements. So I've got my, that picture, I've got the Rob observations logo, uh, that I have. And then I've got whatever picture I decide to make as the, as the thumbnail, <laughs> I just mix and match and it's kind of all set up. It's a template, I drop in things and scooch things around as it is. So, uh, I do that, but now I do have all this Wirecast software where I could make and that John Campia uses. So if you watch a John Campia show, he has a lot more production value, but he's doing it all full time. Now I should switch over. I have all the Wirecast software. I could switch over with graphics and lower thirds. And I, 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 I want to do that. I've been talking about that. It, I'm ready to go, but it, it requires more foresight. And it is like when you're producing the John Campia show for those people who don't watch it. I do it with him uh, every Monday through Thursday from 9 a.m. to 10.30. And John puts a lot of production into that. And fact checker Jonathan, Jonathan Voiko, who's now doing these three to five minute movie news feed packages, video packages, it takes him four or five hours a day to do those because he has to research the stories, write a script, record the script, and then cut together the graphics and everything and then give it to John. So the John Campy show is produced like a TV show and it's, it's like full time. So if you like the John Campia show and, and you know, one of the things, the reason that YouTube subscribe or YouTube personalities or we, we do, I mean, we do need to raise money because it, it is not something that uh, can be done for free. This equipment costs money. I mean, even here, even though I'm talking to you right now, I've got a, a Yeti microphone that was what, 120 bucks. I've got lights up here. I've got a, a iMac, a $13,000 iMac computer with all kinds of stuff here. I got another laptop here. I got another screen here all around me. So, you know, if we're producing content. I mean, this is the 152nd episode of Rob Observations. And while I've just sat here talking to you, it's over 200 hours. Just me talking is over 200 hours of content. Now, 
it really depends. Do you think what I have to say is worth paying for? I mean, that's what super chats are or Patreon or when people become um, uh, subscribers or support me on the burnetwork.net, which by the way, I appreciate it. It's getting bigger and bigger because we have plans for that. What we want to do is I didn't know at least when we do, so when we do the YouTube show, to answer your question, so I basically sit down, but I, even to do this, I still have to do some prep work before I get on. I've got to read all the letters that I want to read or share. I have to make a thumbnail. I have to decide what I'm going to do and then carve out the time. I've been trying to do it consistently, but it's hard because working on these various film projects, like right now, I have to create a DCP of Sky Fighter. Um, which is so they can a DCP can be loaded on instead of a film print, you have a DCP, it's a basically a digital film print, and you can load it onto a server so they can show it in a movie theater at the film festival. And it's due next week, so I have to create a DCP. We are in the midst of creating um, the, the sound for Tango Shalom, so I have to create, I have to make separate videos of all the dance sequences in the movie so they can fully our our. Um, our choreographers to go back and actually do all the dance steps so his feet will match the feet in the movie so they can record the sound of tapping feet because during the shooting of the movie it, you, that sound is unusable because people are talking and there's music playing and so you have to re-record all that so I'm, I'm in the middle of doing a bunch of different things but if I worked like John Campy does all day long uh, it's a full-time job and he's 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 doing it full time and and his income is based on both ad revenue and the support he gets via super chats or his patreon or things like that it's a job and a lot of people think it's funny because oh you're just talking on youtube it's not a job but for somebody like john campia or jeremy johns or 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 people like dave cullen i mean if you look at his shows he he edits them all he records them he actually has cool like animated versions of himself that he cuts in between there's tallula by the way it wouldn't be a show if one of the dogs wasn't barking um anyway i have another letter from cj dunn sup rob no offense about the comment from my last letter about the only talking about star trek on your show i was just being sarcastic and poking fun at you my man i love your show i also love you and campia together i'm writing you today because you expressed your love for anime more specifically giant mecha robot anime and what better anime to talk to you about today than none other than one of the greatest mecha anime IPs, in my humble opinion, Gundam, or Mobile Suit Gundam, which, by the way, debuted, my God, 40 years ago. This is the 40th anniversary of Gundam. Uh, if you haven't seen Gundam, it's one of the great Japanese, uh, it, it's an incredible franchise. Like Star Trek, it's a very long-running franchise. There are very many different iterations of Gundam. I'm writing to you today because you expressed your love. Uh, oh, I love most of the Gundam series. I love how it feels like Star Wars, but with giant robot mech suits and ace pilots instead of Jedi. Quite frankly, I think they handled politics better in some of the series than the entire prequel trilogy of Star Wars. I love the tension relationship between Amuro, who's one of the main characters, and Char, he's like the villain, throughout the Gundam. Gundam Z and ZZ, and finally wrapping up in Char's counterattack. Those are all different... Uh, continuity they're, it's they're in the same continuity different shows um i also love some of the spinoff series my favorite spinoff series is gundam wing mine too by the way i love the overarching series plot and character plots the gundams featured in that series are my favorites as well as the upgraded movie versions still to this day i love the char influence character zex Mar uh, zex marquis milardo peacecraft <laughs> my favorite character though would have to be max duo the pilot of the death scythe hell which by the way is a great gundam uh, his witty banter and incessant need to fight was always charming. The biggest hoot of all was the irony of Duo's personality and the fact that he dresses like a priest while piloting a Gundam that looks like a demon. The only thing that would have made it funnier is if he started quoting complete opposite meaning biblical text before he started taking dudes out or trying to give advice laugh out loud. My next favorite Gundam series would have to be Gundam 00. It arguably feels like an updated version of Gundam Wing, or at the very least, seems to be heavily influenced by it. The Gundam pilots of that series feel like carnival mirror versions of the Wing series characters, but works on a very entertaining level. I will have to say this about Zero Zero. It has a much deeper, darker story than Wing. I mean, the stakes are definitely raised, and the action is more beautiful and intense. The Gundams featured here are two very awesome, as well as their movie upgrades. The movie, however, is not as good as Endless Waltz. 
I could go on. I mean, Gundam Seed, Gundam Destiny was okay. However, to me, it felt like Twilight in a Gundam wrapper, but still decent. Gundam Unicorn was pretty good. I'm currently working my way through Iron-Blooded Orphans, and it is amazing so far. Anyway, how many Gundam series have you seen? Which is your favorite? What is your favorite Gundam? And do you own any Hot Toys Gundams? Thanks, and keep up the good work. Well, for those of you who might not know, the Gundam series, the premise of Gundam, and they have a central continuity called UC, the Universal Century Gundam series. And that's how it first started out. And the premise of Gundam is that humanity has moved into the solar system. There are no really, there's no aliens in Gundam, but they've built a la Babylon 5 or something like that. They've built giant orbiting space, uh, they call them sides, but giant colonies, space colonies, and they're they're orbiting out beyond the moon around Mars, and, and they're huge. And um, basically, there's the Earth Federation, and then there's the orbiting colonies founded the Principality of Zeon, which is their own government, and they want uh, independence from Earth. And so the main Mobile Suit Gundam storyline deals with that battle for independence. And really the whole Gundam franchise is, is about the futility and horrors of war. Now, what's really interesting is um, a Gundam is a mobile suit that's, that a human, a human pilot, even though a, a Gundam, it basically, a Gundam looks like a Japanese, uh, a Japanese samurai robot warrior, but it's piloted by a human being. And they don't really, transform there's transformable elements of gundams but basically and they're war machines and they fight so the groups use these these machines to fight and you'll notice that they do have lightsabers i mean because it was made in 79 but it's very very cool and one of the the endless appeals of gundam are the different mobile suits because they're like spaceships like some people use fighter pilots or fighter planes they're like the f-14 tomcats which they really have in Macross or Robotech, they literally have transformable F-14 Veritech fighters, but that's different. So Gundams have human beings in these robot mech suits that they fight against each other. And I, I've always loved them. I first discovered them when I was a kid. My parents would bring back Gundam toys. I didn't know what they were from Hawaii. Uh, and then I had uh, exchange students, or there was a girl named Kay Morita, who moved here from Japan that I grew up with or I went to junior high and high school with. And she would send me over, get stuff sent to me from Japan. And she was a huge, she really was my, uh, a gateway into Gundam. Uh, but I love Gundam, but mostly I love the universal century stories. Uh, Gundam unicorn was great. I loved Gundam unicorn, but, um, and I do love Gundam wing. The interesting thing about what they've done with the Gundam franchise over the last 40 years is you have the universal century. You call it the main continuity. In Star Trek terms, that would be the original series, Next Gen, Deep Space Nine, and Voyager and Enterprise, the, that continuity. So the Gundam Universal Century continuity is the normal main Gundam franchise, but then they've had alternate universe continuities where they've sort of retold or re-examined the Gundam franchise to keep it fresh because they want to tell more stories not confined by the Universal Century, not confined by the prime Gundam continuity, they did things like Gundam Wing. And what's really interesting is it's a huge toy franchise. Uh, Gundam models, and if you build Gundam models, mobile suit models, it's called Gunpla, G-U-N-P-L-A, uh, Gunpla. And if you go and look online, there's hundreds and hundreds of different Gunpla models. There's different grades. My favorite's the Perfect Grade, which is a 1 60th scale uh, Gundam which I have the, the I have the wing Gundam, the Endless Waltz Gundam, which is one of my favorite Gundams. It has big, gigantic wings. But I think, you know, you asked me what my favorite mobile suit is. Well, this is what, I'll tell you something that recently happened that's killing me. So Bandai, I love die cast. I love the metal Gundam toys. I mean, I, I used to build a lot of master grade and perfect grade Gundam kits, but I like the master, I mean, I like the metal toys, like the metal build and Gundam. Uh, they're always making new Gundam toys. Well, my favorite Gundam is the new Gundam from the movie Char's Counterattack that Amaro uh, Ray flies. And it's one of my favorites. And Bandai has started this new, I've talked about this before, a new, it's Gundam metal something, something, something. But they're making a new Gundam, a die-cast new Gundam that's a perfect grade Gundam. So it's 160th scale. So it's 
It's like this big. It's $900. Well, I was unaware that this was coming out. And like many toys from Japan, if you don't pre-order them, you're out of luck. I did not pre-order this. I did not know it was coming out. I didn't order it from Hobby Link Japan. I didn't order it from, from Big Bad Toy Store. It's sold out everywhere. And it doesn't even come with all of the, the fins. You have to go to the Bandai Tamashi Nation's online store. They haven't even gone up for sale yet to get the, the fins. So it's going to cost you over $1,000 to get this ultimate... Uh, Gundam toy, but I desperately want it because it's awesome. Anyway, um, I also like, so all the Universal Century stuff, but I also like Turn A Gundam, which is kind of a weird one-off series. Um, I know I'm, I'm boring everybody talking about Gundam, but anyway, I want to thank you for that letter. I'm a huge fan of, of, of Gundam, and I want to thank you for writing in. I love talking about Gundam. Uh, this next one, Orlando Logan Olivero. Actually, you know what? Let's see what's let's 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 go over to you guys. Let's see what's happening in the chat room. And uh, so here we go. Uh, wow, a lot of people. Um, <laughs> Willow Yang says, "Every time I watch the Schmodown, I feel dumb. I'd be lucky to get even one question right. <laughs> I do enjoy all the flair, though. <laughs> yeah, it's funny. I mean, when I first when I started doing the Schmodown, and give it up for Mark Ellis and Christian Harloff for making a movie trivia show and combining it with the WWF, the World Wrestling Federation. It's crazy that they do it. Um, before it started, it was, I mean, it was used to just be a, a movie trivia show, and then the it was always based on wrestling, but wrestling was a small part of it, but now wrestling has become a much bigger part of it. It's still fun, but everybody now takes it way too seriously. Nobody is just saying things they know off the top of their head anymore. They're all studying, and that's no fun, but it's still fun to watch, I think. Uh, I just don't want to compete because it's too stressful. So I've become a heel. I didn't know what a wrestling heel was. So now I created basically a, a douchebag character where I can scream and yell and rant and rave, and it's fun. I, I have fun doing it. Uh, Mark C. says, I just found a Blu-ray of The Iron Warrior, <laughs> the sequel to Ator, The Fighting Eagle with Miles O'Keefe. Score. Wow, Ator, The Fighting Eagle. Man, there was a lot of weird, in the wake of Conan, these weird, low-budget rip-offs of Conan. And Ator, The Fighting Eagle, was one of those. Like, you're the hunter from the future. Ator and you're different movies. But The Iron Warrior, I didn't even know they made a sequel to Ator, The Fighting Eagle, Mark C. That is amazing. Uh, Echo Base Network is here. Hello, Echo Base Network. Um uh, 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 it's funny because when I hear see Echo Base, I just I hear the dialogue in Empire. Echo three to Echo Seven, Honol, buddy, do you read me? Uh, Echo Base says you're talking about taking human elements out of movies. Makes me think of Kirk and his hatred for the Klingons, then being redeemed with them in Star Trek: The Undiscovered Country. You know, it's interesting. I, I, to be honest, in Star Trek Six, uh, Kirk talks about after Praxis is destroyed. He talks about the Klingons letting the Klingons die because they're Star Trek Six has a lot of goofy stuff. And I like Star Trek Six, but it's got a lot of goofy stuff in it that doesn't make a whole hell of a lot of sense. But I did not like the element where Kirk is shown as being a racist against the Klingons, calling them they're animals, Jim. They're dying. And then at the end, of course, I understand it was a glasnost, it was all about a Cold War thing, but but here's, here's, I think, one of my biggest problems with the Star Trek movie series as outside of Star Trek The Motion Picture. I felt the Star Trek movie series, even as much as I love classic Star Trek and I, everyone knows I love the original series, I felt that they took a turn and made them very didactic and they made them very simplistic. And uh, I thought the way they dealt with the Klingons, the first time you ever see the Klingons in Star Trek, the very first time, was an errand of mercy from the first season. It's also the uh, episode they introduced the Organians. And uh, John uh, Colicos playing Kor, who was the first Klingon we ever saw, ends up having a relationship with Kirk, who's undercover. And they sort of develop this friendship. And Kor has sort of an admiration for Kirk, not knowing he's a starship captain, thinking he's just a traitor named Barona. And I thought the relationship that Kirk and the Klingons had in that episode, there was no... He didn't think the Klingons were animals. And, and I think the real problem with the Star Trek movie franchise is while as much as I love Star Trek The Wrath of Khan, it, it wasn't subtle anymore. It was Star Trek, even, even the original series, 
and as pulpy as it sometimes could get, there's some really adult storytelling going on. And the characters seemed very well-rounded and very nuanced, believe it or not. And not every episode, but I could give you 25 episodes of Star Trek, if you're not familiar with the original series, that are very that are very nuanced and, and ask very interesting uh, three-dimensional questions. And I, I think that the, the film series should have been that way. Like, I'll give you an example. If you look at the movie Master and Commander, Peter Weir's movie Master and Commander, it has nothing to do with Star Trek, although it is a nautical story, and it's like... It's like Horatio Hornblower, which is one of the inspirations for uh, Star Trek that Gene Roddenberry always cited. And I think that that, I wanted to see more, I mean, Star Trek II has a lot going on in it. The, and uh, the, the scene with Kirk and McCoy in Kirk's quarters, now a lot of people would be like, well, that's not what we want from a Star Trek movie, but it's those scenes, these adult scenes where two men are discussing life, you know, it harks back to Balance of Terror. And the relationship, we we saw Star Trek get dumbed down. And people think of Star Trek, I think, in the pop culture memory, especially the original series, because it, the pop culture memory of Star Trek is that it's flying kicks and green women and Kirk getting down with them. And when really Star Trek is a very sophisticated, very adult show at its finest. And people forget about that. In Star Trek VI, I thought it was very one-dimensional. And uh, as much as I do enjoy Star Trek VI, there's a lot of it that I just am like, it shows every, um, uh, it, 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 it shows everything that I think is sort of wrong with uh, modern Trek. Uh, and, and it was, I don't know. But there's a lot to love in Star Trek. Uh, you know, that's, that's what I, so anyway, what I'm trying to say is, yes, but Kirk never had hatred for the Klingons. Kirk didn't have hatred for anyone. They added that as part of that movie. He didn't hate Klingons. Klingons, here's what's another people, here's another thing, another a truism of Star Trek. Not only should you, when you approach Star Trek, should you be making a show about the best of the best and that your audience should want to hang out and be a part of whatever ensemble cast you're showing us. But, um, there are no villains in Star Trek. There are antagonists. And that is a very different thing. And we, specifically, ever since Khan was introduced in Star Trek II, they've always given us these villains. And they have forgotten how to tell Star Trek stories with antagonists. And that's a very different thing. And look, we saw in the latter season, this, this, past, this past, the last half of Discovery, we had the worst kind of car caricature. I mean, it was such a, a ridiculous throwback uh, control and Section 31. I mean, my God, talk about mustache twirling, non-nuanced villains. It was not not good. Anyway, John Harrison says, Rob, I watched a movie earlier you might uh, know by the name Free Enterprise. <laughs> well done, sir. It was very good. And Shatner doing rap. I did not expect that. Well, thank you, John. Uh, I appreciate that. Hopefully, I will be able to uh, bring back Free Enterprise again in what I'm calling the Final Frontier Cut, where I want to go back in. And the version you saw, I would imagine, is on Amazon Streaming, which is not my preferred cut of the film. And it was it's a 4 by 3 transfer that I supervised in 1999. It should never be seen by anyone. Um, but that is just me. Uh, Mark C. says, DCP is that Digital Cinema File. Well, it stands for Digital Cinema Package. But yes, that's basically what it is. It's a Digital Cinema File Package that can be played on uh, the projecting systems that they have in movie theaters. All movies now are delivered as DCPs to their respective theaters. Um, <laughs> Mark C says, Gundam Tank has been my favorite since 1984. Yeah, there's a couple of them. Um, but but basically the Gundam franchise is, you know, it's a, it's a, it's a war franchise. It's about the futility of war. Uh, this one comes from Orlando Logan Olivero. Howdy, oh great sanctimonious one. Just checking in. I'm here at my house outside of Austin, Texas, about to eat some barbecue brisket. But before I get my hands dirty, I wanted to give you a quick weather update. It's still damn hot. It's hotter than fandom arguing the merits of The Last Jedi. It's hotter than Luxwana Troy at a bachelorette party in Jamaica. It's hotter than my main man, Rodan, flying out of a Mexican volcano. So that brings me to my topic. Godzilla, King of the Monsters. 
I wanted to thank you for your pre-review. I definitely was already aboard that hype train, but I bought that ticket and you, my man, stamped it. I am a longtime kaiju fan. I'm somewhere between big fan and hardcore fan. I've seen every Godzilla film, collect the toys, etc., but I don't participate in the forums since the fandom can actually be more aggro than the likes of Star Trek, Transformers, and yes, even Star Wars. Dude, don't mess with hardcore Godzilla fans. I once had a 12-year-old attempt to correct my pronunciation of Hedora. I, I always said Hedora. Is it not Hedora? Um, or is it Hedera? I, like Ghidorah, I was like, or Ghidorah, I was like Ghidorah Hedera. Oh, well, it could be wrong. Tough little bastard. Side note, the Transformers fan community can be very much combative as well. I have been referred to as a G1-er. <laughs> referencing the fact that I'm a Generation 1 fan. It is meant to be somewhat derogatory, but I'll save that for another time. I recognize that you are a true, knowledgeable Godzilla fan. Like me, it was acquired over decades of movie-watching experience. Today, people become instant experts on anything geek-related because they can read something on Wikipedia in one minute or watch some video that explains something. So with regard to Godzilla King of the Monsters, I understand that it didn't do amazingly well here in the States and that the licensing deal with Toho will conclude in the next few years. There were speculations that it might be renewed pending the success of these films, but I worry that may not be the case after the film's performance. I think it's a shame. I absolutely loved it, and it is somewhere in my top five Godzilla movies. I liked it more than Infinity War. I think the director, Mike Doherty, gave true fans the movie we wanted and genuinely cared about the source material. He absolutely did. With Marvel movies, I notice that there is more fan service geared toward new fans and people that don't really read comics. That's fine, because they have competent filmmakers that know how to give an old-school Marvel reader enough to enjoy without complaining too much about inaccuracies. I will say, though, that King of the Monsters provided a type of fan service that went past the average moviegoer's heads. Those sorts of risks don't always equate to box office profits. I like that. They didn't have to put in a certain musical cues, sound effects, or obscure references that would be recognizable to Godzilla fans. But to me, it was delightful. I was quivering in certain parts of the movie. Man, I was too, dude, to be honest. <laughs> By the end, I wanted to stand up with my hands in the air and praise the almighty Krom. <laughs> Crush your enemies, see them driven before you, and hear the lamentations of the women. So I wanted to get your final impressions on the film and the legendary monster verse. What did you like, not like, and what are your thoughts on Godzilla vs. Kong? I personally would love to see Mr. Taco <laughs> Taco make a uh, guest appearance because he is simply adorable. Stay gangster, Rob. Orlando Logan Olivero of uh, Terranodon. Uh, I think it's Terranodon, right? Uh, media. Well, Orlando Logan Olivero, here's, here's the thing. I've often talked about the fact that Western audiences don't necessarily have whimsy in our genre entertainment. It's hard for us to grasp it. And I think the legendary universe, beginning with Pacific Rim, see, to me, Pacific Rim was, I love Pacific Rim because Guillermo del Toro understands the whimsy inherent in the whole concept of giant kaiju monsters and, and giant robots fighting them. Um, you, <laughs> There's a lot of people that couldn't buy into it. A lot of people say, oh, it's just a Top Gun ripoff or whatever. But, but if you understand that if you get that idea and i don't think a lot of people do what what everyone is doing to in my mind in terms of the criticisms of godzilla king of the monsters is they're applying they're they're not allowing for the whimsy inherent in the concept they want it to be serious you know they want in godzilla 1998 they they mistook whimsy for kind of lowbrow stupidity <laughs> if that makes any sense. Um, and there's something very different. Uh, whimsy can still be smart. And I, you know, one of the things I love about, look, I was watching um, uh, Neon Genesis Evangelion the other night. Actually, yesterday I was watching because I wanted to hear the American dub. If you guys haven't seen Neon Genesis Evang uh, Evangelion, uh, if you haven't seen it, it is, it, is a, it is a Japanese anime show from the mid-90s. It is... It is very, very uh, interesting, and it's it's it. At first glance, it seems kind of goofy, but when you get into it, it's pretty incredible, and it deals with a lot of existential uh, things going on. And Earth has been laid siege to by these strange giant creatures called the Angels, and Nerve 
uh, God is in his heaven and all is right with the world. This agency is combating these angels by building these, again, mobile suits. They're not like mobile suit Gundam, but these giant Avas that are huge robots to fight these things. But there's a lot more going on than that. And, it, you know, once again, it struck me that what's interesting about Evangelion is that it's it's both whimsical and yet very serious and introspective at the same time. And it threads that needle. Now, there's a lot of people that aren't going to respond to the whimsy uh, in it. And also, the it, it it has a very, as many Japanese things do, it's got, the, the sexuality might be problematic. The, the, the objectification of women might be a little problematic for some people. But then again, there's a lot of very strong female characters. But anyway, uh, I've lost straight. I'm not, I haven't finished this. I haven't even finished this. Uh, this. Well, I did. I, I did. I finished his letter. But I think that one. I'm. I'm going off on a tangent. I think one of the things about giant monster movies is they are inherently goofy. Now, the original Godzilla is not. Rodan is not. Rodan is actually a pretty scary movie that turns into a giant monster movie. But it's as you get into things like destroy all monsters and Godzilla or invasion of the Astro monster or Godzilla versus monster zero, which is one of my favorite Kaiju movies. Um, things change and, and there are varying degrees of, of seriousness. The last Toho Godzilla movie, Shin Godzilla, I really loved because it's basically a procedural from FEMA's point of view. How would FEMA respond to a giant monster attack? And, and I thought that that's, that's a really interesting, an interesting thing to do. And I think that the legendary universe, Godzilla ver, uh, Kong Skull Island, I thought was great. I, I loved it. You know, make it set it in the seventies. You've got it's it's <laughs> it's got apocalypse now, Vietnam War imagery, whatever, and then combine it with a giant monster movie, and then you have some wacky whimsy in it as well, which is that that is great. And Godzilla King of the Monsters was the same thing. I mean, people talk about that human stuff; they didn't like it all. But I think what Mike Doherty was really going for was a, a real Japanese feel, which combined the sort of goofy, whimsical human elements with the giant monster elements. And I really, I really responded to it. I, I, I saw what he was doing. I get it. I mean, you know, that doctor says she's, she's, you, you realize that she's one of the Mothra twins. She's like, I'm third generation monarch. I'm like, oh. And then when you're hearing the original Godzilla themes, and it was great. I mean, I, I loved all of that stuff. A lot of people, aren't going to aren't going to be into that but you know the Godzilla movies if you've watched a lot of them like when in the early 90s when they when they brought back that new series and when I cried in the the early 90s Mothra movie Godzilla versus Mothra I, I I cried that movie choked me up at the end uh Godzilla GMK all out monsters attack that's a great movie that's like the first time that you see you see human beings watching a monster battle from like miles away and you see Godzilla blowing his nuclear fire turning to the guy with who's watching from miles away and <laughs> he gets taken out with the it was great. If you guys want to watch a a great one-off Bond or Bond film. If you guys want to watch a great there are two Godzilla movies that I would recommend as one-offs that you can watch and not know anything about the Godzilla franchise. Godzilla GMK All Out Monsters Attack uh, and also Shin Godzilla which is the last of the Toho movies that just can't watch those two movies. They're very, very, very interesting. Um, but yeah, I want to thank you for that letter, Orlando, because I thought uh, that was a, gr a great letter. And uh, yeah, you're right. I mean, there's, there's, um, there's, uh, there's great stuff there, but I think American audiences might have a bit of a problem getting into that kind of thing. Um, but I've always loved it. You know, Galaxy Express, 999. Um, uh, Stubble McShave says thoughts on Beastmaster with our favorite actor from V, Mark Singer. Okay, uh, Beastmaster was a low budget movie again that came out in the heel on the heels of Conan the Barbarian, and it was directed by Don Coscarelli. I'm a big fan of Beastmaster. I'm a huge fan of Don Coscarelli. For those of you who don't know who Don Coscar Don Coscarelli is. He is, of course, the mastermind behind one of my favorite horror films of all time, Phantasm. Boy, you play a good game, boy. But the game is finished. Now you die. I love Phantasm. One of my favorite horror movies of all time. But he made Beastmaster. And uh, I love Beastmaster. What's not to love? I mean, I saw Beastmaster in the theater. And Mark Singer, indeed, from V fame, is in Beastmaster. They, they're threatening to remake it. I think they're going to remake it. Uh, but how can you not love the Beastmaster? Mark C. says, Kirk's hatred of Klingons had to do with the death of David. 
hard to explain unless you have a child. Yeah, but you know what? I get that. I mean, it was certainly set up. But I even then, I think that Kirk, Kirk, uh, he lost people before. It's not like David was somebody he just met. You know, it wasn't like he grew up with David and raised him as his own son. But yes, I, 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 I know. I mean, I get that. But I still don't. I never believe the turn that they made in Star Trek VI. Um, <laughs> Mark, Mark C also says, if you check out Neon Genesis Evangelion, stay away from the Netflix redubs. It's terrible. Okay, for for what Mark C is saying, so um, Netflix just dropped Neon Genesis Evangelion yesterday. Now, why is this a big deal? Well, in the early, the last time Evangelion was out, it was put out on uh, DVD, which I have. I have the DVD box set in the aughts, in the noughties, 2004 or five. I don't remember when I got the discs on, on DVD. And it, it's really been out of circulation since then. So Netflix brought it back. They restored it. They, they restored it to, to high def, but they have very controversially created a new dub track. And what's interesting about Evangelion is they've been making these, well, they've made three movies that sort of retell the Evangelion story. And they used for their English dubs in those movies the same people that did the English dubs for the original versions uh, of, of the series itself, the TV series. Well, for whatever reason, Netflix threw out those dubs and, and brought in new actors and redubbed the whole series. Now, I don't like watching anything dubbed because a lot of the time it's not translated correctly especially with with anime anime it's not it does it's not done well so they have included the original japanese language track but i did watch it yesterday because i want to hear the new dub which i the actors are doing a fine job it's just not it's so weird to hear it differently because it's not right it doesn't matter how good it might have been but everyone is saying that the new dubs are not good uh and i'd have to go back and watch the series because i haven't watched it in like 10 years other than the new movies so Anyway, um, this next one comes from Lewis Jones. Hello, Rob. I just want to say thank you before I get into my main point. I might not agree with everything you say, but that's okay. You're probably the most knowledgeable person on YouTube when it comes to the film industry, at least that I know of, and just hearing you talk about it is very inspiring. Also, sorry if this ends up being a bit long. A couple of days ago on the stream, you did a story about Michelle Rijuan, and you very briefly mentioned The Mandalorian, which gave me the inspiration to write this to you. I have to say, Star Wars is a franchise I've always enjoyed. I remember when I was little, I was snooping around my dad's room and found these three VHS tapes. <laughs> this could have gone real south, very south, very quickly. On one was a bearded man in a hood. On the other two were a little green creature and a scary looking man in a mask. I took them to my father and after telling me off for going through his things, he sat me down and we watched all three in succession. It's safe to say the original trilogy was the best thing I'd ever seen at the time. Then the prequels came around. More Star Wars? Great. One of those was good. Decent at best. We are currently well into the new era of Star Wars, which I'm enjoying for the most part. I have my problems with it, of course. I wish the original cast got a scene together and they didn't kill off Luke the way they did. But the films have been well made and I'm quite taken with the new cast. My biggest problem, though, is that for whatever reason, I've become quite just disenfranchised with Star Wars as a whole. But don't worry. I'm getting to the point now. I saw all of the footage released for The Mandalorian during Star Wars Celebration, whether it be through the stream or leaks of the stuff they didn't release to the public. I felt something I've never genuinely felt before. It was a feeling I didn't understand at first. It's taken me this long to realize what I was feeling was nostalgia for the first time in my life. I wonder... Why is it this show specifically has taken me back to feeling how I felt that first time watching the original trilogy with my father all those years ago? What is it doing right that the prequels and the new canon have failed to achieve? I think the answer, or part of the answer, is that it all feels honest. During the panel at Celebration, the filmmakers and cast all came across as so honest and passionate listening to them talk about the process of making the show and how they're experimenting with how to make shots of ships flying through space practical and the cast insisting they do their own stunts. It sounds like proper old fashioned filmmaking at its finest. I love it. I really do. The new films and prequels feel clinical in comparison. Listen, I could go on for hours about this. So I'm stopping myself here. You can thank me later. <laughs> Whether or not you read this on air or not, thank you for taking the time out of your day to read my rather long list of thoughts. 
Keep doing what you're doing, man. Your efforts are greatly appreciated. Lewis. Well, Lewis, first of all, I want to thank you for that writing. Uh, thank you for writing that letter in. By the way, as always, if you want to write me a letter, please go to my website, thebrunettework.net. You can write me in you, uh, a letter, send it to me there, or you can also, well, you can submit a three-word movie review, and who doesn't want to do that? But anyway, uh, you know, I feel the same way. They, I did watch, okay, I admit it. I watched the bootleg scene where the Mandalorian goes in and talks to uh, Werner Herzog about, about his, whatever his, his, his mission, so to speak. Um, I mean, there was a gonk droid. <laughs> you know, I watch it. I'm like, this is star Wars. I felt like for the first time, the, the prequels are, are uh, like I've said, I think they're bad movies, but they're interesting and good star Wars, if that makes any sense. But when I was watching the Mandalorian, it was the first time I'm like, Oh my God, this feels like it's in the star Wars universe because the prequels felt like, you know, it's a different time. And the new, one of my problems with say JJ Abrams Star Wars I'm like why are tie fighters tie fighters but they're just black now and you've got a gun on them uh, uh, it doesn't seem it's weird like it didn't it didn't further the franchise I felt like I was watching when you say clinical it it, it was weird it didn't I didn't buy it and I also didn't understand look what is my old adage the brunette axiom, the number one brunette axiom, never put your universe before your characters. Never, never, never. And in Dave Cullen's show, it talks about, what you, 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 he points out Kurtzman's quotes where he's talking about the Star Trek universe, the Star Trek universe. I'm like, you, get, you don't get it. You know, you're thinking about creating a Star Trek empire when really what you should be thinking about is you need to create characters that people want to hang out with. That is the fundamental, that is the very basis of any of these great franchises. You look at all of them. What do they have in common? They're all filled with characters that we as the audience would love to hang out with. We love the characters. I don't love the characters on Star Trek Discovery. I don't love any of them. You know, whether if you're Tilly and you're on the spectrum or you're Stamets, you're mad all the time. You know, you're you're not. Uh, Lorca is, turns out to be a douche. Burnham just does stupid things and thinks the world revolves around her. I mean, there's, there's, you've got to make characters that you admire, that you would want to be friends with. <laughs> that's, that's what, that's this, the, the key of all, or either you either want to be friends with them or you want to be them in the case of say James Bond. And um, yeah, and I think you're right. When I saw that Mandalorian stuff, I'm like, wow, this feels like star Wars. This feels like uh, absolutely. Now, uh, this last letter I'm going to read is it's I, I'm going to say right now it's political, it's uh, it's it's political, and uh, I'm I'm it, it's gonna it directly addresses um, it directly addresses the rifts going on in fandom and specifically Mark C's letter from the other day. So you, I just want to uh, I want to you know get you guys ready. Mark C. also says, The Mandalorian is Dave Filoni plus Star Wars equals real Star Wars. Absolutely. I mean, if anything, you know, Dave Filoni is like the way Ryan Coogler was to the Rocky franchise when he did Creed. Dave Filoni is that guy for the Star Wars franchise. And I think to a certain extent, my friend Steve Melching is like that as well. And that's what they need. They need more of. People that really understand Star Wars. So I agree with you, Mark C. But this next letter, this is the last letter of today. But it's a great letter, and it comes to us from Paul from Long Beach. You know him, you love him, arguably one of the funniest men and members of this, the post-geek singularity community. Paul from Long Beach is here with a letter, and I hope the moderators are here. Are the moderators here? <laughs> are they here? Uh, so moderators, uh, uh, <laughs> here we go. Here we go. Paul in Long Beach says, morning, Rob. Again, I am so happy the three-word review is catching on with the post-geek singularity. Like many of us, I worked in a video store during high school. My boss had two simple rules. Don't lie to a customer. If you haven't seen a movie, admit it and ask if anyone else had. And if you have seen the movie, use as few words as possible to describe the film. Don't spoil it, basically. Thus, the three-word review was born. And yes, Mike, fabulously follicled Connery, is mine for Sardoz. <laughs> and yes, Mike, meaning Mike Bodden, fabulously follicled Connery is my three-word review for Zardoz. By the way, if you guys have not seen Zardoz, everybody makes fun of it now. It's great. Uh, it was put out by, um, did Twilight Time put it out? Or no, it was Fox. 
I don't know who put it. I have the Blu-ray for Zardoz. It's great. You got to see Zardoz. If you haven't seen it, you got to see it. John Borman, it's great. Don't listen to anybody tell you anything else. Now, I'd like to respond to the gentleman again. This would be Mark C. he's responding to. I'd like to respond to the gentleman again because I'm one of those West Coast lefties he describes. I will agree with two of his statements. The PC police are way out of control, but it wasn't the social justice warriors that drove Kelly Marie Tran off social media, nor were lipstick lesbians involved in the James Gunn saga. I'm no fan of whataboutism, so let's be honest with each other. It is not a one-sided issue. Rob's friend had his site hacked last week, and it surely wasn't Brie Larson's fault. I will also agree with the gentleman on another point of contention. Since he brought it up so often, I politely suggest that he does take off his tinfoil hat. There isn't some grand conspiracy to indoctrinate or replace you. Taken together, the letter is a gobbledygook of grievances. Therefore, I'd like to focus on four points he made individually. One, West Coasters have no idea of the pulse of the rest of America. Just so we're clear on the same set of facts, America wanted and got the Smurfs too. America loved Alvin and the Chipmunks so much, they made a squeakwool. <laughs> if the gentleman was unaware that the force is female was a Nike marketing campaign, he should be ashamed of himself. If he was aware and failed to make that note for political reasons, he should be ashamed of himself too. By the way, what is wrong with marketing to girls anyway? Do you not believe in the free market? And I quote, after talking to friends in the military, Holdo should not have held back that info. He's well liked. I have put the brakes on that. <laughs> I have to put the brakes on that tripe right this second. It's called military effing protocol, sir. I don't believe that for one second that any of your friends in the military would ever speak that way to an American general while on duty, male or female. And because reality matters, Pro probably would be sitting in Leavenworth right now for mutiny. Four, it bears repeating even if the wording is different. Robert Meyer Burnett doesn't have a seat at the table. John Campia doesn't have a seat at the table. That douche in Long Beach, meaning him, our letter writer, doesn't have a seat at the table. Whatever the hullabaloo, Darth Harloff doesn't have a seat at the table. Four middle-aged white dudes, two of whom moved to Hollywood from the rest of America, that damn Canadian socialist, and me. <laughs> Can you please explain when you did, in fact, have a seat at the table? I honestly can't recall reading a more white male privileged sentence in a while. Pat yourself on the back. Kevin Smith said it best on one of his recent, recent podcasts. The only wrong with Star Wars is Star Wars fans. Cheers, Rob. Paul. Well, here's something re really interesting. Now, Mark C., who's been a great supporter of this channel, has always written me thoughtful letters. And he's all, all, always thanked me for trying to provide a forum uh, where all, both points of view are recognized, or all points of view are recognized. And I've always thanked him for that. And here's the thing. Everybody is welcome here. And, you know, Mark's letters, whether as Paul disagreed with him, uh, has shown Paul didn't say, I think that guy's an ass. And Mark C. has never written in, and said, called names or said anything mean. We can all discuss these situations. I mean, you know, Paul's letter here is, I'll admit it, Paul, you're a little condescending. I get it. I understand. But you know what? I mean, there's nothing wrong with that. There's also humor here. Paul's also one of my favorite comedians who writes into the show. So the whole point is actually keeping that discussion going. And Mark C has been a thoughtful, ongoing contributor to this channel. And he's always been polite and nice. And yet he's always tried to state his very uh, uh, deeply held beliefs in a manner which is respectful to everybody here and to me. And and Paul, who's, who's his cutting edge and sometimes caustic wit, has done the same thing. And that's why I wanted to read this letter. And I think it's pretty great. But I think, I think what's really interesting is at the end of the day, whether it's Dave Cullen, whether it's me, whether it's Midnight's Edge, whether it's Dictored on Doomcock, whether it's it's Gary Beekler at Nerdrotic, whether it's Geeks and Gamers, whatever. Whether you like these channels or not, I, I tend to try and watch all of them. I'm watching more because people keep telling me about other channels. The one thing, the one thing that I think unites us all is, and it goes back to 
the premise of my entire chat today is the power of storytelling. More, most specifically, the power of great storytelling. And I think all of us, everybody certainly here, all of the people that make up the intellectual dork web, which I just want to say I stole that term. Somebody called me being part of that, along with Midnight's Edge and along with Gary Beekler at Nerdrotic and along with Geeks and Gamers and all these other channels. It's just that um, I think our levels of where we're where we're placing the blame for things. I think if, I think I bring a much more pragmatic uh, uh, business point of view to these things. I, I'm not a shill for the studios. I, I freely admit, if you want me to shill for you, please send me money and I'll shill, and I'll I have no problem. But that's not my thing. I don't get paid, but I have worked at movie studios. I worked, like I've said before, I worked at Warner Brothers in feature production under senior vice president of production. I've worked uh, on many different things within the entertainment business over the last 30 years. So I've seen things from the inside out. And a lot of the, the mistakes or a lot of the things that people like, for instance, the Kathleen Kennedy, the, the blame that they get placed on her is simply, I simply disagree with that assertion. And having worked in the motion picture business, that's why I have a different point of view and i hope you know a more manageable point of view and then someone you can turn around and go well, why do you say these things about star trek discovery and it, I, the reason is is because i i believe that the people who it's a paycheck for them and they they're making something that they're trying to get away unlike what ryan coogler did with creed who was somebody who loved the franchise and really tried to make something that worked in continuity with the franchise and and add to the franchise we're dealing with people that that want to change fundamentally change Star Trek. I always think that's a mistake. Now, I don't think that anybody, when it comes to movies like Captain Marvel or when it comes to movies like the Star Wars, the the sequel trilogy, I don't believe that decisions are made based on a social agenda. I don't think anyone's going, we're going to make an overtly feminist movie. They're not. What they're doing is they're trying to serve a worldwide audience. They haven't made a front line. They made Captain Marvel because they hadn't made a movie that 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 uh, had a, a female superhero in it yet. That was their. They want to capture the female audience. They want to serve the female audience, and that was their. That was their. I have Gilbert here. He's barking. He barked at me. Whenever Gilbert's barking when I'm on TV, uh, what he wants is a cookie. So Gilbert and Tallulah will get cookies now. Uh, while I'm on camera in the midst of this. Okay, here you go. Here he goes. There you go. There are cookies. I don't know if you can see them, but they're both here. There you go. Now leave me alone. Because um, I have to wrap this up. But anyway, because um, I have to go schmo down. But so I, th there isn't, uh, at the corporate level, you have to understand, the only thinking at the corporate level, especially in Hollywood, is, how do we appeal to the most amount of people and how do we make the most money? How do we spend the least amount of money that will make us the most amount of money? And how do we mitigate our risks? The last thing Hollywood wants to do is get into some kind of ideological debate or furthering. Look, it's no secret that people who work in the arts in general are, they're more liberal because you have to be because you meet <laughs> within the arts, the people that are attracted to the arts, it doesn't matter what, whether you're a ballet dancer or whether you're a painter or whether you're a filmmaker, there is a certain mindset that goes along with, with the arts. That's just, it's inherently built into the whole process. Why are you barking at me? And um, you, you can't get away from that. So there are people that aren't maybe necessarily in the arts that are fans of this stuff. So you get these monikers thrown your way. These you get, Oh, you're uh, so stupid. A libtard. You, people start talking like, Oh, you liberals out in Hollywood. Well, no, that's just a function of, I think the arts in general, no matter where you are. So then it's easy to make that leap going, Oh, you're a, there's a, there's an agenda here. Well, look, is there an agenda that the Chinese audience has become hugely important to Hollywood in terms of box office? Yes. Does it make sense to include more people of Asian descent in worldwide films? Yes. I mean, one of the one of my favorite movies of the last decade, I love this movie so much, is Ridley Scott's The Martian. I love The Martian, especially the extended version that's on 
that's on Blu-ray. I love The Martian so much. I watched to me, The Martian is a near perfect movie. And people, if you watch The Martian, it's it's the Chinese have a huge hand in saving Mark Watney, which I loved. I love that I love the way they incorporated the Chinese into The Martian. It seemed realistic. Um, and yes, it 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 for the Chinese audiences who wouldn't you have an emerging market of 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 uh, like a quarter of the world's population, it would be stupid not to start catering to the Asian market to make money. That's what you're trying to do, you know. And they have very strict rules about what movies can play there and what movies can't play there. And the same is true of in the geek space. We have watched over the last 30, 25, 30 years as women have joined the gaming community, the cosplaying community. Now, when you go to Comic Con. It's 50-50. When I started going to Comic-Con, this will be my 31st Comic-Con. And when I when I see how Comic-Con has changed, yes, there are more women in this space. It's now I wouldn't even I wouldn't even bat an eye when you talk about girl gamers. Sure they're, they're everybody's we live in the post-geek singularity community. And the idea that these these things are agenda based that Kathleen Kennedy is a woman, therefore she's responsible for Holdo or whatever. But I've maintained, as I said in the last chat, that um, when we were talking about Mark C's letter, Star Wars began with Princess Leia, who's a badass female. You know, I think if if the the political climate was such as it was as it is now, as it was or, or was forty years ago, people would be accusing George Lucas of having some uh, a feminist agenda. But the fact is, that's what made Star Wars cool was that that Princess Leia kicked ass, that she should she she stood up to Vader and Tarkin. And she didn't just stand up to them. I mean, she's like openly disdainful and insulting these guys that would have killed her where she stood. But she didn't. She didn't. She 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 went right at them. I mean, I recognize your foul stench when I was brought on board. I mean, come on, who didn't love that? I remember. I remember when I was a kid. I was ten years old. I'm like, they're gonna kill her for saying that, uh, you know. And and it was it was. I mean, Vader's choking out out generals and why wouldn't he kill princess leia you know and i and i and i think that again i've always talked about how my problem look and i think that mark i think that whether it's geeks and ga gamers whether it's the fan the, anything to do with the fandom menace anything to do with the intellectual dork web all of us at the end of the day we all come from a place that we want great stories that are well told all of us because we want stories that have truth in them and stories. The, the problem now, especially with Star Wars, is, is that it's owned by a corporation that has to, by definition, appeal to the greatest common denominator because they are pressured to have a return on their enormous investment. And in order that which means that all of their decisions are based on money as opposed to telling a great story. I believe that you tell a great Star Wars story, you're gonna make the most money you can. The more the the better the Star Wars story, the better off you're going to be at the box office. And and I think it was an absolute mistake. It was a corporate mandate, a corporate decision that they had to introduce a bunch of new Star Wars characters for this last trilogy. I think their biggest mistake of uh, and I think it's a huge error is that we did not get a movie where Han, Luke, and Leia and R two and three PO were all together. That was a, a, a gigantic error in judgment. Why did this happen? Because I'm sure it came on high, came from on high above even J.J. Abrams and Lawrence Kasdan that you guys have to make a movie that introduces new characters that we can market because all of our main characters are old. Harrison Ford's in his 70s. You know, why we don't, kids are not going to buy toys of Harrison Ford as a 70 year old man. My contention would be that kids aren't buying toys like that anymore anyway. Certainly not in the, kind of numbers that they used to because the world is changing what they're doing is they're flying the millennium falcon in battlefront or whatever game you're going to come up with the world has changed but they made a huge error in not giving us a movie where we got to see han luke and leia and lando and r2 and 3po and chewbacca together because like i said at the beginning of this what we want is we want to ultimately see movies that are about characters that we want to hang out with and they made a new Star Wars trilogy that never got our characters together. And that to me, this is, this would be, if I was running Disney and I spent $4 billion on Star Wars, my mandate to, to them, the filmmakers would be that 
before anything else, you need to put our, since we're going to have Harrison Ford, Carrie Fisher, and Mark Hamill in a movie together, and R2 and 3PO and Chewbacca, we need to have a scene or a sequence or something where all of our favorite characters are working together to kick ass. Men on a Mission movie, like beginning of Return of the Jedi, the rescue of Han Solo, when everybody played a part. That would be my only mandate. I'm like, you're going to bring Star Wars back. I need a gigantic hero moment where all of our venerable characters do something kick-ass. And that whole scene could be a half an hour long. I don't care what it is. But I would have said, if I was Bob Iger, I would have said, that's all we want from this movie. We need that in the first movie. We need all of our characters together. How this was not done is way beyond me. I mean, this to me is a no-brainer, and this is the problem. This is the single problem that all, I think, all of these groups, uh, I think we could all agree, if they had a scene like that in the movie, we might be a little bit more, uh, a, and, and you spin off these new characters out of all of that. But we never got that. They bring back our favorite characters from the original Star Wars trilogy, and let's face it, the original Star Wars trilogy is what Star Wars is, really, when people think about it. And you didn't put those characters together. That to me is that is that is the ultimate kind of corporate wrong-headed corporate decision making because someone's like, no, 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 we need all new characters. We need all new characters that we can market and kids today will buy these new characters. This is wrong-headed. And and this is why this is why people never put your universe before your characters. The characters Han, Luke, Leia, Chewie, R2, 3PO, Lando, that is Star Wars. That is Star Wars. And, and you guys, they effed up, man. Uh, that's the biggest mistake that they've made. Now, what's really interesting is at least what I've seen with The Mandalorian, The Mandalorian doesn't have any of those characters, but the Star Wars universe has been well-trodden ground on many different things. We've seen spinoffs and offshoots. The Mandalorian from that scene, the bootleg scene where you see The Mandalorian going to meet Werner Herzog, you look at that and you're like, well, that... That kicks ass. That immediately feels like Star Wars because everybody who's making that is they're unfettered by the Skywalker saga, so they can just go make a movie in the Star Wars universe. And everybody working on it, including Dave Filoni, and they all know they all, they're all filled. Look at Taika Waititi, even Bryce Dallas Howard, who directed an episode. They all grew up. They get it. They understand. And and so they're going to go off and make this ultimate. The Mandalorian is not constrained by having to earn back enough money where you can justify spending $4 billion on Star Wars. They already did that, so the pressure was off. And, and I think, anyway, I, again, it all comes down to storytelling. What is it we love? I mean, we're looking at these things wondering, we want to believe, I mean, a lot of people want to believe that there's this agenda-based storytelling. And indeed, there is people with their agendas. It's like, we bring back girl power, but there's always been that in my lifetime. But yeah, they're 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 trying to appeal to more people. They're trying to bring more people into the fold. But agenda based storytelling is like anything else. You're putting your universe before your characters. You can't put your agenda before your characters either, because that doesn't work. But there are people now that are that are I think believe in an agenda believe that this agenda is is like there's a cabal of people going where you're going to put this stuff in. Indeed all over college campuses, in the editorial rooms. There's all kinds of people that are screaming about their agendas. That's true. Those people are wrong. Those people are wrong. You never put your agenda before your, your characters. You don't put your universe before your characters. It never works. And now we're going through a period of time that, yes, a lot of these things and a lot of the people like Mark C. in his letter is correct in pointing out that we're now dealing with agenda-based storytelling. I mean, what's, what's really interesting is that uh, they don't, Whenever you change something, whenever, like, for instance, Doctor Who, Jodie Whittaker playing Doctor Who, all right, the, the the question that you have to ask yourself is, okay, you've got a Time Lord. If, if Jodie Whittaker is a woman, now, what are uniquely, what are you, we, we have this idea that women and men are, are, are equal, this idea that we're equal as, as being equal as a human being is one thing, the essence, the idea of what a human being is. I believe in complete equality. Of, of men, you know, uh, men, women, all people, all human beings, that all sentient human beings, actually, I think that non-human beings, any, any, any sentient creature, but human beings, I believe, are, are equal. Now, men and women are not the same. <laughs> we're, we're, we're different. 
we're different. We do. We have different. Our biologies are different. Uh, our our mental processes based on our biologies are different. And this idea that everybody has to be the same is weird to me. Like I don't get it. Like I've never once. Like I don't. I don't know what it's like to to the idea even in the back of my mind that I could ever bear children. And and what does that mean? Like if you grow up, there's a desire in you. Like what it, you either choose to bear children or you don't. But you have the ability to do so. So it's 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 a part of your essence that you're going to think about your whole life. Well, I've never thought about that in my whole life because I could never bear children. Like I, frankly, if I thought about it, I'd probably be pretty damn terrified to have a, a, a human being gestate inside my body and come out of it. I'd be living in fear of that moment. I mean, I don't even like to get shots, even though they don't hurt. I, I the anticipation of them is tough, but I can't even imagine anticipating you know, delivering a watermelon sized thing out of the inside of my body. But, but we have these differences and, 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 um, they have to be recognized. And I, I think that I love stories like that. I love stories that, that are where, where you deal with those kinds of differences that are in, inherent and, and it's, it's, it's realistic, you know, and, and now there's this, these agenda based stories or things like that are, they're skewed. They're not, they're not genuine storytelling. It's, it's, it's not true to itself. And I don't like that. And I think that's what all of these, these people are responding to. But what's great is the flip side of that is that there's so many people now that are getting opportunities to tell their stories, which I think is fantastic. And, and we're just going through a transitional period where everybody who hasn't been able to tell their stories are putting their agendas first and foremost. And, and that will, like I said, and that's what, what Paul said, that will shake out because agenda-based storytelling, they're not, they're just ultimately not the greatest stories in the world. And again, oh, let them run outside. Again, you can't put your universe and you can't put your agenda in front of your characters. It never, ever works. But I also don't think that there's this cabal of people that are making these decisions like, oh, we're going to foist this agenda down someone's throat. I don't think it works that way. Um, because at the end of the day, all Hollywood really wants to do is, is make sure that you are, um, you are, are watching their stuff and you're paying money and it's all about making cash. <laughs> you know, it, it's, it's more about making cash than it is about foisting an agenda on somebody. It really is. And, and I can, I can say that to you from, as <laughs> I listen, to them. it's just true. Mark C says, I love Medicine Man. If politics were an issue, then I shouldn't enjoy the film. Here's story and character are, in my humble opinion, strong enough that being a message film doesn't bother me. Plus, I was inclined to ponder the message. Okay, uh, you're, I believe you're talking about John McTiernan's Medicine Man. Um, <clears throat> I like Medicine Man. I didn't think it's the greatest thing in the world, but yeah, you're right. Again, the, the you can have agenda based storytelling you can you can in, infuse your story with politics but but it should be inherent and and it should be inherent to the story that you're telling i love political stories i i tend to believe that every story has politics in it of some kind every story is political in some way shape or form because whenever you get human beings together to do anything you put 10 people in a room it's going to be political it's always going to be political because people are making decisions you know, based on their beliefs and, and what is best. And, and that's what politics is. You know, I think kids learn politics from the little kids, you know, you have five friends to get together. What are we going to do today? Well, it becomes a political question. You have to do some political maneuvering and convince people to come to your side. Well, let's go play baseball. Let's go to the beach or whatever we're going to do. Let's go see a movie. You know, if you don't have consensus, how do you gain consensus? It becomes political. And I think one of the things that, that, I find distressing about the time that we live in is that rather than be asking for better storytelling and rather than look at it as a business decision, Star Wars is now defined by money. It's all about a business decision. It's all about a company. We love Star Wars for what it is, but how, you know, it doesn't show up on a spreadsheet that if you've bought Star Wars that Disney bought is a product. No one at Disney is going, you know, what is Star Wars? in our in our uh, culture well with star trek they made the exact opposite decision they decided that oh we have to go back to what star trek is which is kirk spock and mccoy 
and Scotty and Sulu and Ahura and the United Spaceship, the United Starship Enterprise. And, and so let's go back to that. But what's really interesting is Star Trek has allowed those characters, we watched them grow. And, and, and oh, from 1966, if you go all the way up to Generations in 1994, if you go from 1966 to 1994, we watched these characters, Kirk, Spock, McCoy, Uhura, Chekhov, Uhura, uh, Sulu, Scotty, grow up within the confines of pop culture. They aged. They went through middle age. And it, it, it may age in the movies. Kirk eventually died. And, and we, we saw that happen. So to go back to sort of recreate, it's not like James Bond or Batman where you keep having new actors. We had the same actors play those characters for a quarter of a century. And so going back, it's like, well, okay, but what happened is they're not telling the kind of stories that those, they, they have the characters, but they're not telling the kind of stories that those characters were known for, which is why I think the J.J. Abrams movies didn't necessarily work very well and why I thought it was a mistake to bring certainly the Spock of Star Trek Discovery is not the Spock we know from Star Trek. Uh, anyway. Guys, I guys, girls, gentle beings, all of you, I'm going to bring this chat, I think, to a close only because I have to go schmo down today. Uh, I believe the, the schmo down event is live. I want to thank everybody for sending in letters and participating. You can send me letters at thebrunetwork.net. Obviously, uh, you can, you know, participate, go to the website, do whatever you want, send in three word reviews. Thank you for supporting the channel via your super chats and becoming an Imagination Connoisseur supporter on the website. I appreciate that. I appreciate the great work my moderators do, Detective Jim, the Honorable Mayor, Mike Bodden, Terry from the UK, and of course, Greg Smith. You guys are great. Couldn't do it without you. You keep everybody honest. And most of all, I want to thank you, members of this, the Post Geek Singularity community and my Imagination Connoisseurs. Actually, you're not my imagination connoisseurs. You're your own imagination connoisseurs. We're all imagination connoisseurs together trying to get through each and every day on this world as it spins around the sun. Uh, and it's fun to do it with you. So I want to thank you all. And uh, I say then, remember, every person you meet has a story to tell you have yet to hear. All you have to do is listen. And I will be back tomorrow with something else to talk about because after all Rob observations is the show about something thanks very much and as always have a better day <laughs>